Hi guys and welcome back to the channel. I'm finally settling down a little bit more in Queensland. There's still a lot of boxes to unpack, but I've also had some time to enjoy the beaches and finally got my first bird photos as well that I want to share with you today because there were some unique challenges that I faced and I actually ended up having to use flash to balance out the scene. And that's something I hadn't done with the F5 in almost two years because ever since I got in the F5, I really felt like the need for flash almost disappeared but in this unique situation it was actually impossible to take nice and balanced images without the flash. I want to share some of the results with you, run you through the challenges and show you how even in extreme light situations with the right technique you can take some amazing images. My target birds on this particular trip were region bowerbird, satin bowerbird and green catbird. All very difficult birds and I quickly realized when I got there that the best opportunity to photograph these birds would actually be on the balcony of my accommodation. So there were a lot of fallen trees around. I grabbed a couple of branches, attached them to the rail of the balcony and the birds would come in, land on the perch, grab a sultana and then move on. So that presented me with a really good opportunity to get these otherwise quite difficult to get birds. However, it also presented me with a very challenging lighting situation. The background was distant mountains, so it was very bright because the balcony actually had a roof. There was basically no light on the birds at all. So now I could have overexposed a lot to get some detail in the birds, but then my background would have been completely blown out and the birds would have had just really unpleasant washed out and still noisy look just something I don't like at all so I actually decided that I would use fill flash to expose for my background and then balance the rest of the scene with the light of the flash so that I actually get a properly exposed bird and a properly exposed background the good thing was and the only reason that I actually use flash is that the birds really didn't care at all and that I could use really low amounts just enough light to actually light up the scene and balance out my background Ever since I've gotten the F5s, I'm really not a big fan of flash anymore. First of all, it's really annoying to use. There's just no fun in taking out the flash and then you have to worry about your frame rate and what shutter mode to use. And there's a lot of things that make it really annoying to use flash. So whenever I can, I avoid it. But in this situation, it was actually impossible not to use it. So with the F5 or most mirrorless cameras, there are a few challenges. I usually like to use the electronic shutter mode, but on the R5 that actually doesn't work with the flash. So I have to use either the mechanical shutter mode or the first curtain electronic shutter mode. And I ended up using the first curtain electronic shutter mode because I have relatively low shutter speeds and that usually gives me better results than the mechanical shutter. The mechanical shutter of all the shutter modes definitely gives me the most kind of out of focus or slightly blurry images. So whenever I can, I like to use the two other modes. Another important consideration here was the bitrate. In the electronic shutter mode, the R5 produces 12-bit RAW files. In the first curtain electronic shutter mode, it produces 13-bit RAW files. And in the mechanical shutter mode, it can produce 14-bit RAW files if you use one of the slower RAW modes. And I think actually in the first curtain electronic shutter mode, if you use one of the slower frame rates, it also produces 14-bit RAW files. Because I knew the birds would be so dark and I had to lift the shadows a lot in the editing process, even with the flash, I was very careful to not use C-Raw and also try to use the highest possible bitrate, ideally 14-bit. Because when you lift dark areas, C-Raw and lower bitrates definitely have less details and more noise and that's something I wanted to avoid. I decided to shoot in the high plus mode with 13 frames per second in the first curtain electronic shutter mode. Once I show you the sample photos, you will see that I really needed every little bit of image quality that I could squeeze out of the images to maintain detail in those really dark areas of the bird. The biggest challenge I found was actually the EVF when using flash and also using the EVF in this particular lighting situation. With DSLR cameras, you just have your optical viewfinder and you just see the scene through your viewfinder basically like your eyes would see it. But in the EVF, if you're using flash, the camera turns off the exposure simulation. And what happens in this case is that my viewfinder becomes really, really dark. When I look through my viewfinder, basically I'm only looking at a black bird in front of a fairly dark background. And I found that really, really challenging because at times I couldn't even see the eyes of the bird simply because the bird was dark 
and the foreground with the bird was so dark as well and the dark plumage so I couldn't see the eye at all anymore which made it quite difficult to actually focus. But this is where the R5 really shined and surprised me the most. Because in the past in these lighting situations with the DSLR camera with a really bright background and a dark bird, oftentimes the camera would just always jump straight onto the background because the contrast there was just so much higher and it would actually be very difficult to focus in these situations. On the R5, however, the eye tracking worked really, really well, even on essentially a blackbird with a really dark foreground, and it would still find the eye and track the birds very well. And interestingly, if you watch some of my videos, you know that I always use the spot autofocus on one back button and the eye tracking on the other back button. And I usually use the spot focus through like pre-focusing or if the eye focus doesn't work. However, in this particular case, the spot focus basically didn't work at all and it would behave like a DSLR camera. If I tried to focus on the perch or the bird with the spot autofocus, it would almost instantly get caught onto the background. Another challenge when using flash as well is that you can't often shoot with the highest frame rate. If you shoot at 13 frames per second, just put your finger down and shoot away you will likely have a lot of images that are not flashed. And in this situation, that's something that renders those images useless. So in order to get the most images flashed and get the most usable image, I did a few things. First of all, we have to remember that when we're shooting birds, especially birds in like darker environments that quickly just hop along your perch, we need a high enough shutter speed. So for me, the ideal shutter speed was between like a 400th and an 800th of a second. That means that we have to be in high speed sync mode on our flash. And the higher the shutter speed, the more the flash will struggle and the more non-flashed images you have. So it's a little bit of a trade-off. Basically, I want to have a shutter speed that's fast enough to freeze the birds, but slow enough that my flash doesn't struggle too much. And for me, between the 400th and the 800th of a second with my extra battery on the flash usually gives me some good results. And then the other thing I've noticed that when I'm in the high speed plus mode at 13 frames per second, the best way to get the most images flashed is to actually do little bursts. That way you get a lot more flashed images. For some reason, if you're holding down the button, the flash really quickly stops recycling and you're getting a lot of kind of black photos. Before we jump into the examples, you might ask yourself, how can you use flash for bird photography? And I've made a separate video about that. You can check that out. But what I'm basically trying to do is just balancing the light in the scene. So I'm exposing for the background until there's no more blown out areas in the background. And then I'm dialing up the power on my flash until the flash that hits the bird gives it the same kind of brightness as my background. And in this case, I was lucky I didn't have to use much flash. Unfortunately, there's no magic formula when it comes to finding the right balance between the flash power and the balance and getting the overall scene nice and even. It's really just trial and error. So I usually expose for the background and then dial up my flash power until it looks good. And I do that by just taking test shots off my perch, for instance. So I start at a low power setting on the flash, take a shot. If it looks too dark, I dial up the power a little bit. If it looks too flashed, I'll dial down the power a little bit. And eventually I will find a good power. And whenever the light kind of changes during your day, like there's clouds coming in, it gets darker or the sun is coming out, you will have to adjust your shutter settings end of manual flash to actually be able to keep that nice balance in your photos. But now I think it's really time to look at some of those sample images and some of the images that I got and sharing with you how I got them, the technical difficulties and how I managed to edit them to make them look amazing in the end. So let's jump right in. So let's start with an example to show us exactly the difficulties during the editing process. Bright background, really dark bird. Here the flash didn't find, it's basically an impossible image to deal with. So here we have an example where I balanced out the background with the light really nicely and that will allow me with a little bit of editing to bring back the details in these areas on this satin bird and will give me in the end a really nice looking and balanced image. Here's the next bird, another one of my target species, a really cool Regent Bowbird male calling. We zoom in, we can see really nice and sharp but quite challenging to get enough detail in the face and the belly of the bird. 
Interestingly, in this case, noise is actually not as much of a problem because the background is so bright and bright backgrounds generally don't show much of the noise. So I'm running this at ISO, I think, 1600 and I might not even have to use Pure Raw to denoise it, but I will use Pure Raw in a couple of the other images that I'll show you. And you guys often ask me, how do you do Pure Raw as a part of your masterclass? But it's so simple that I don't actually talk about it that often because you download the XO Pure Raw you load your RAW file into that, you download the right preset for your camera and lens combination, and then you basically click one button and it starts. There's only two settings you can change, and usually I turn off the sharpening, which gives me better quality. So all in all, on my M1 Max MacBook Pro, or this computer, it takes about seven seconds to run an image, but it can take a little bit longer if you have a slower computer. So all I do is basically load my RAW file into DxO Pure RAW, click one button, it creates a noise-free DNG file. I then open up that DNG file in Adobe Camera Raw, load my Pro Sets onto the file. My favorite Pro Sets are usually Vibrant Jack of All Trades or Vibrant More Contrast. Once I've done that, I make a few more tweaks, click Done, and that opens as my background layer in Photoshop. I'm now gonna save that file as a PSD file. And because I'm doing that, I'm maintaining that DNG file within that PSD file, and I can actually go ahead and delete the DNG file that DxO Pure Raw created for me because those files are, can be quite big and I don't really want to keep them around. And because I'm saving the PSD file with all my layers, I basically have a copy of that DNG file within my file. So I don't really need that other file and can discard it. And here's another image, one of my favorite images that I took on that weekend of a king parrot, a little bit dark. The red colors especially are always really painful to deal with. And in this image in particular, I used the red punchy Pro Set and it really helped me to maintain the detail in the red, but also make it more punchy and also give me more detail in those underwing areas, for instance, giving me a really good starting point with just one click and then the whole image was just a few more edits away in Photoshop to give me a fantastic looking final result. If you want to learn all about the Pro Sets and how to edit your images to perfection, make sure to check out the Pro Sets and my masterclass down there in the description. And now we're on to the two favorite images of mine from this trip. First, we're gonna look at a pair of region bowbirds, and then my first ever photo of a green catbird. The biggest challenge in particular here was getting the colors on the male right, because the yellow is really saturated and the black is really black. And when we go on to the final image, you can see that I was actually able to get nice details into the tail area of the bird here and also onto the back of the bird. So how did I do that? There's a few tricks you can use. For instance, for the back of the bird, I actually used a couple different exposures of this image. First, I made one exposure that was perfect for the overall image. And then I made another exposure where I pulled up the shadows a lot and made the image brighter. And then this image I put on a separate layer in Photoshop and then simply just brushed through some of the brighter areas on the back of the bird, giving me more detail in those areas without really affecting any of these other areas. Where you want to be careful though with black birds, you want to keep them black. You don't want to lift the shadows so much that they look gray and have detail. You rather want areas with no detail, but the bird looks nice and black, because I think that looks more pleasant overall to our eye. Let's look at the tail, for instance, because that was also an area where there was basically no detail at all. And here I just used a little trick. I used the curves layer. I made the curve very bright, hit the layer, and then I just used my brush and kind of just outlining the outside edges of the feathers allowed us to create much more visible detail in the bird. And if you want to learn all about these little tricks on how to get the absolute most out of your bird images, make sure to check out my masterclass down there in the description where I teach you step by step how to get the absolute most out of your images and create true pieces of art. And lastly, I want to show you this awesome image of a green catbird. Here's the raw file. Great details. It's a little bit more noisy, so I ran it through the XO Pure Raw, and then during the editing process, I paid attention to these leaves because they have these unpleasant shiny areas here. So I made sure that I darkened these down. And then there was a bit too much light on this part of the bird and not enough on the head. So I balanced that out and then I removed some of the highlights from the flash and gave the image an overall nice balance 
And look, I'm really happy with how some of these images turn out, especially that region bowerbird pan, that green catbird. And if you want to see some more images from this trip and a really secreted bird that I managed to get some great footage of, make sure to tune in to the next episode of the Bird Photography Show that will come out in the next few days on my channel. I get asked a lot, how does the R5 or R3 or R6 work with adapted older EF lenses? And I must say they all work really well with them. This relatively inexpensive adapter actually does a really good job and allows us to still use our old lenses on the new mirrorless cameras. The newer lenses, for instance, 100 to 500, definitely have a little bit better image stabilization and much faster autofocus, but an older lens like my f4 600 millimeter version 2 lens still work really well and as you've seen with the image examples even in extreme lighting situations the f5 manages to work really well with the older lenses and give me great autofocusing and also great image stabilization and great overall images with fantastic sharpness so if you're upgrading to the mirrorless system it doesn't mean you have to instantly upgrade all your lenses of course, it's nicer to work with the newer lenses, but you really don't have to. For instance, you can just get one or two RF lenses as your main lenses, the ones that you use all the time, and then over time upgrade your other lenses. For instance, I've only recently started to upgrade all my lenses to the RF, and I'm still using an older 70 to 200 and my F4 600 millimeter lens, for instance, in the EF version, and they still work very well. So there's no rush when it comes to updating to the new mirrorless lenses, although if you can, they're definitely a little bit nicer to use and more fun to use in the end. I really hope you enjoyed this little video into my first excursion into the Queensland rainforest and the challenges that I faced and I hope you learned how you can deal with very difficult lighting situation, also got some ideas how it might be easier for you to edit in these difficult situations. And if you want to learn even more about image editing and getting the absolute most out of your images, make sure to check out my pro sets and masterclass down there in the description. Other than that, I'm hopeful that I will be able to more regularly make videos now. I hope you enjoyed my new studio space. And like always, give me a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, leave me a comment, and I will see you in one of my next videos very soon. Bye, guys.